Well, welcome to our Old Testament study or Old Testament history study again tonight. We're starting to transition now into the major and minor prophets. But uh, before we start talking about that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this, this month of May that's coming up, this will be the, at the end of May, will be the last of the online lectures for Wednesdays because starting the 1st of June, we're going to be having our summer sermon series here at the building. So I want to encourage all of you to, to come and be a part of that. But that being said, we do have about four or five weeks here of, of this that we're going to be looking at. And there's no way, there's no way we can get through all of the major and minor prophets in four weeks. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically take a look at uh, an introduction to each one of the major prophets. Then we'll move in and take a look at some of the keys uh, that we always look at in these studies, and then um, we'll kind of introduce some of the minor prophets that will be associated. But I think the important thing to remember as we go through this, uh, this last portion of this study with the major and minor prophets is to understand what they are more or less doing in a very general sense here. They are bringing God's message of judgment to the people of Israel and Judah. And that being said, uh, it's it's not a judgment without hope in their message. The prophets will uh, condemn the sinful behavior of the people, but let them know that God is a forgiving God, a gracious God, a saving God, and uh, encourage the, the repentance of the people. So that, in a very, very general sense, is what we see the prophets doing. And so tonight, what we're going to take a look at is the, the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel. I'd like to leave uh, Daniel by itself, and I would like to take a look at Jeremiah and Lamentations together, uh, each of those in a separate study. So tonight we'll look at Isaiah, unpack with Isaiah's message, and try to do some of the same with Ezekiel. And then next week we'll move into Daniel, and the week after that we'll look at uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. So welcome tonight. Hope you enjoy the study. And uh, God bless you. All right, in way of introduction, book of Isaiah. Isaiah can kind of really be looked at as a miniature Bible. Because interestingly enough, it's almost as if the first 39 chapters of this book, just like the first 39 books of the Old Testament, are filled with judgment upon immorality, idolatrous men. And for See, Judah has sinned, and all the surrounding nations have sinned. The whole earth has sinned, and, and judgment must come from God. Uh, he cannot allow such blatant disregard, blatant sin, to go unpunished forever. But interestingly enough, the final 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah, just like the final uh, 27 books called the New Testament, is a message of hope. It's a message of salvation, that the Messiah is coming, that a Savior and a Sovereign will bear a cross and wear a crown. And so Isaiah's prophetic ministry, if you will, spanning uh, the reigns of four kings of Judah and covers at least 40 years. All right, just let's take a look now, if we can, at uh, the time of Isaiah. Um, as we look into this, I think it's interesting to take a look at the name of this book, Isaiah. It really falls in line with the theme of the book of Isaiah, which Isaiah simply means Yahweh is salvation. And so very much so as we read through the, uh, this particular book of the Bible, we see how uh, Isaiah's message comes across that the Savior is coming, that he 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 will bear a cross, he he will be he will suffer and die, uh, and so very much of the latter part of the book will really center upon this message of salvation coming through the Messiah. Interestingly enough, as we take a look at the the time of Isaiah's ministry, it ranged like we said earlier, almost like forty years. 
He begins his ministry near the end of King Uzziah, Uzziah's reign and ends it around the reign of Hezekiah. Assyria itself is beginning to grow in power. And as that power uh, increases, they begin the process of conquering the west, and now they begin to move to the east. This conquest was made up of just plucking up little small towns along the coastline, if you will, of the Mediterranean, and Israel and parts of Judah were part of that conquest. And Isaiah lived during this time of military threat to Judah and warned its kings, continually warned the kings against this threat. Now, as a contemporary of Hosea and Micah, he prophesied during the last years of the northern kingdom, during the last years uh, of his ministry to the southern kingdom of Judah, who followed in the sins of Israel. So basically, uh, what we're looking at there is, you know, He's prophesying to both nations and letting them know the consequences of these sins. So that being said, after Israel's demise in 722 B.C., he warned Judah of judgment coming as well, but it's not going to be from Assyria. It's going to be from Babylon. And even though Babylon has not yet risen to power, he is warning these people of a coming judgment. So with that said, now let's switch over and take a look at some of the keys that are important to realize as we read through this book. All right, so the first key we want to look at is a key word, or in this case, a key phrase. And as we've already said, it comes from the name of the book itself, which is salvation is of the Lord. Now here, this is the basic theme that we find in the book of Isaiah that salvation is of the Lord. And, and it plays itself out over in this book. The word salvation in the book of Isaiah, it's going to appear over some 26 times. Compared to uh, all of the other uh, prophets, they, uh, in comparison, so what's my note say here? Uh, some seven times. Some seven times this phrase is used in them, but Isaiah, it's over 26 times. So that, that amount of usage alone clearly points us to a basic theme and a key to understanding the book of Isaiah, and that's how salvation is going to come from God. And uh, the, the message is, is redemptive, it is full of hope, uh, but it takes us a while to get there, as we've talked about. Because you see, salvation does come from God, not from man. And God has seen the sins of the people, and as we've said, must punish them. And so Isaiah is warning of this coming judgment upon Judah, as as well as Israel, and throughout the throughout this whole time, God is solemnly warning them of their uh, moral depravity, of their political corruption, uh, their social injustice, and especially spiritual idolatry, which always seems to be a problem for these people. But the nation does not turn from its sinful practices, and as a result, they are overthrown. Nevertheless, God remains faithful to his covenant, his covenant with Israel, and there's a remnant that's preserved in this process. And through that remnant, the Savior will come out of Judah and accomplish this dual work of redemption and restoration that we've already talked about in our studies. The Gentiles will come to this light, this universal light, as well through the message of Christ. And so, as we're kind of looking at, at, at this, as you read through this book, you'll notice that phrase quite often, that salvation is of the Lord. And I think that's a key phrase for us to take away as we look through the rest of this book together. Let's look now at some more keys. Okay, for some key verses now, Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, as well as chapter 53 and verse 6. Those are some pretty key verses in this particular book. Let me read the... Uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will fall upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom 
to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We've looked at this passage our whole lives, and we see this verse being used in the New Testament as well, but just for us, just unpacking it here in this study, once again, it's the concept coming up of salvation and where it's going to come from. But this salvation is not going to be something that's temporary. In this passage, Isaiah is saying that this son that will be given, this child that is born, is going to establish this government or this kingdom, if you will, that will last forever and ever. And it'll be the zeal of the Lord. It'll be the, the passion of the Lord to make this happen. And so what we see expressed here is God's ultimate desire, his ultimate passion. And that is to provide this, this way of salvation through this son in which all children, Gentile and Jew alike, can come to him. Now let's take a look at the second passage coming from uh, Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse number 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Simple passage that just recognizes the reality of our existence is that we are by nature, we are fallen, we are sinful, and we are in need of help that we cannot provide for ourselves. And so Isaiah prophesies that all of that burden, all of that sin is going to be laid upon this son, this Christ, this Messiah, in which we will then be able to receive this forgiveness that God is so passionate for all people to be able to experience. Okay, the last key I want to take a look at is a key chapter, and that has to be Isaiah chapter 53, because it's in this chapter, along with Psalms chapter 22, it's in these, these two that there's this listing of the most remarkable and specific prophecies of the atonement of the Messiah that's going to be coming. And ultimately, all of these prophecies will be fulfilled through Christ, through his Messiahship. So these two chapters I'd encourage you to take a quick reading of and, and read it through the lens of faith. Read it through the, the eyes in terms of what Jesus is going to be providing and making possible by taking up the iniquities of us all. Okay, picking up now with the book of Ezekiel, which in Hebrew that name means uh, God strengthens or strengthened by God, which is very much the case of what happens with Ezekiel. It's really interesting how what the, the definition of some of these uh, names of these prophets translate into what their actual ministry was. So it's almost their identification, their uh, who they who they referred to themselves as was was more of a commission by God and what they were doing for Him. Uh, but that being said, uh, Ezekiel can be considered both priest and prophet. Uh, he ministers during the darkest days of Judah's history. Uh, the 70-year period of Babylon captivity is pretty much where he is going to be. He's carried to Babylon before the final assault on Jerusalem, and we'll get a little bit more into the time aspects of all this in a moment. But uh, as he's carried off to Jerusalem, Ezekiel uses prophecies, parables, word plays, signs, symbols, all these things as a, a dramatization of God's message to the people uh, in which God is to be exalted. God is to be uh, revered. So this is kind of the form that his prophecies take. Uh, example is, through, uh, though they are like dry bones, Ezekiel will say in the sun, God will reassemble them and breathe life into the nation once again, and that this present judgment will be followed by future glory so that you shall know that I am the Lord. What a beautiful prophecy and just kind of a word picture of, of what's going to happen through the Messiah that we just looked at in uh, Isaiah. 
It's that all of us are like these dry bones just laying out into the desert. But God is going to reassemble those and breathe life back into those bones. And he's going to do it through this coming Messiah. And what is at one point death now is going to represent a future glory. Perfect, perfect word play, if you will, on what Christ is going to do through us today, as well as through the remnant that's going to come through uh, Judah and Israel. And so that kind of gives us a basic introduction of a big picture, if you will, of what Ezekiel is going to be doing and what he's going to be focusing on. Now let's go ahead and jump over, if we can, to look at some of the keys, once again, of this particular book. All right, uh, key phrase, key word, uh, however you want to take a look at this, has to be the, re the future restoration of Israel. The broad purpose of Ezekiel is to remind the generation that's born during this Babylon captivity of really the reason why they're there. This generation born during this exile is there because of Israel's current uh, rejection of God, and it's, and it's this coming judgment upon them that, that they are now living as a part of. And so reminding them of this, what Ezekiel wants to do as well is remind them, we're here because of some consequences, but we want to rec recognize also of this future hope of the restoration of Israel. And as you kind of outline this book, you can kind of see that message slowly coming out. You know, first, we in the beginning of this book, the first uh, three chapters, you have this, this incredible commission of Ezekiel where he sees the glory of God and, and then he receives this commission from God to go and basically perform these signs, give messages of judgment on Judah. And then also he, in chapter 25, he'll start to make uh, the transition of the judgment on the Gentiles. So both Jew and Gentile alike is, is going to be suffering because of their rejection of God. But then this corner gets turned in, in 31, chapter 31, where he begins this message of Israel's return to the Lord and this restoration of Israel in the kingdom. And this whole restoration of Israel in the, in the world is, is where we get to this key phrase that we're using, that we're Ezekiel, like Isaiah, starts off with this really uh, gloomy message of judgment. He moves to this message of hope and restoration. That is the gospel message in its totality, if you will. It's this message of how we have uh, lived and, and are living as in consequence of our sin and rejection, as, as Paul will say, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God is not content to leave us there, as we saw in Isaiah, that he will send uh, this Messiah to take our iniquities, to take those sins upon himself, so that we may be able to be restored. And it's not just Israel that's going to be a part of that restoration. It's going to be both Jew and Gentile alike, and that's why I think Ezekiel, Ezekiel's message here is on both of these people, is that he's letting them know that there is going to be come a time, both for these people and people to come, in which there will be a restoration that takes place. And so that's our key word or phrase, is this, this concept of the future restoration of Israel. All right, key verses. Some Beautiful, beautiful passages in this book, but I really want us to take a look at uh, Ezekiel 36, 24 through 26. Uh, and then we'll take a look at another one in a second here, but let, let me just read this beautiful passage. Once, you get, once again, this is uh, chapter uh, 36, verses 24 through 26. And the Lord speaks here, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all of the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you 
and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What, what a beautiful passage of what God is going to do in the lives of his children that he's going to gather them from wherever they're at among the worlds, and he's going to bring them together and sprinkle them clean with water from all of their filthiness and from all of their idols. And then he's going to place this spirit within his people and this heart that's going to be new. And so there's that, that beautiful message of, of restoration that Ezekiel is so fond of and that he shares with the people constantly is that God is going to do incredible things through you. So even in your darkest hour where we see Ezekiel prophesying, the darkest hour of the people of God, even in that moment, please know that God is in the process of bringing us all back together redeeming us and sprinkling us clean or, or, or washing away our iniquities through his son so that we can have a new heart and have this new spirit placed within us. Okay, a, another verse that I'd like to for us to take a look at happens later in this same chapter and it comes from verses uh, 33 through 35 of chapter 36. And in this passage, Ezekiel is going to be telling the people of, of a future in which they will be returning home and that, uh, that the people of God will rebuild the city of Jerusalem in such a way that to where people will look upon it and see it as a, as a Garden of Eden. But let's take a look at this passage, uh, chapter 36, once again, uh, verses 33 through 35. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all of your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and in the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilted instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and are inhabited. This prophecy, once again, of Israel returning home, that what God is going to do on that day that he cleanses them from their iniquities is he's also going to rebuild their homes and provide for them this, this land of covenant that was given to them through, uh, through Abraham. And so that gets two pretty key verses, one that I think, uh, the first one, which I think focuses not only on Israel, but focuses on us, but uh, definitely the second passage that focuses on the restoration of Israel and their return home and the rebuilding that's going to be accomplished uh, through ne Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, and, and, and even Esther, in, in a sense, her role in that to help out as well. So uh, let's look now at a key chapter. Ezekiel chapter 37 uh, has to be a key chapter in this book because it's central to the hope of the restoration of Israel. And it is the vision in which we get this, this vision of the dry bones that we talked about in the beginning of our study on this particular book. So Ezekiel 37 outlines with clear steps Israel's future. Well, I hope as we've gone through this, you've kind of seen some of the, the, uh, the way that these two prophets build off of each other, where Isaiah is speaking of this salvation coming from the Lord, in which this, this promised Messiah is going to take upon our iniquities. And then when we turn over to Ezekiel, it's, it's that time of, of doom, of, of a very difficult time for the people of God. And his prophecy is to remember that God is going to take these iniquities that Isaiah has talked about. He's going to wash them clean. And he's going to restore all of his children back to their homeland. And this, in a nutshell, is the, the kind of the, the focus of these two books put together. They really kind of feed off of each other, if you will. And I hope you've kind of seen that as we've gone through it. 
Now, going forward, next week we will take a long look at the book of Daniel. Just a wonderful book with lots of, of uh, stuff in there, uh, apocryphal literature, things of that nature, but ultimately prom uh, promises and prophecies that we see fulfilled uh, through Christ. But also we see the working of God's power in the people, even in the midst of their captivity. So come back next week. We'll take a look at the book of Daniel. And I pray God blesses you and strengthens you and keeps you safe. Have a great rest of your day.